This podcast is brought to you by the Albany Public Library, main branch, and the generosity of listeners like you. What is a podcast? God, Daddy, these people talk as much as you do. <laughs> Razib Khan's unsupervised learning. Thanks for listening to the ungated version of the Unsupervised Learning Podcast. If you want to read some essays on some of these topics, please check out razib.substack.com. Again, that's razib.substack.com. Thank you. Hey, everybody. This is Razib here with the Unsupervised Learning Podcast. And today, I am here with New York Times columnist Ross Douthit, who is also the author of The Deep Places, The Decadent Society, uh, The Change of the Church... I don't know about that one, actually, (laughs) Uh, but uh, Bad Religion, I know about that one, and of course, Grand New Party, Um, and so we're going to talk about something a little different uh, than those of you who um, read Ross's New York York Times columns, although I think if you read it closely, uh, you won't be that surprised. Uh, I want to talk about uh, fantasy literature, uh, genre literature, because, you know, I've been reading Ross, uh, well, I mean, almost two decades now, almost two decades, we're both old. Um, and, uh, occasionally he does let slip that he is a, a genre literature reader. Um, and since, you know, I am too, but I'm not a cultured person. <laughs> so, um, Ross writes for the New York times. He is a columnist. And so I want to start out with, um, I mean, do you have to justify yourself? I mean, as an educated person who appreciates the arts, uh, admitting to reading genre fiction, I mean, well, first, thanks for having me. Um, It's yeah, it's a nice it's a nice (laughs) change of pace um, to to talk about fantasy and genre. I mean, I don't I mean, I don't think I have to justify myself nowadays. Right. Because we live in an age when genre has has conquered absolutely everything. Um, And if anything, it's sort of, you know, whatever remains of high culture that has to justify itself. Um, and, you know, and I'm, you know, in a little bit of an odd position because I spend a certain amount of time complaining about genres takeover of absolutely everything I have, you know, I moonlight as a movie critic for national review. And one of my running complaints is, which, you know, is now widely shared is just sort of, you know, the, the Marvel comic book blockbusterification of, of absolutely everything. Um, so yeah, by being, in a way, by being a, a genre person and being conflicted about it, I guess I'm sort of typical of, you know, pseudo, pseudo cultured people in the early 20th century, early 21st century. Um, but I did grow up, you know, everybody, I was not a comic book guy in, you know, our lost, our lost youth in the 1990s. I was a sort of originally Lord of the Rings Tolkien guy, but then very much a sort of, I mean, pulp i think pulp fantasy not true pulp like not like sort of you know whatever what a grindhouse fantasy <laughs> you know whatever if you go back not not a like yeah. conan the barbarian guy but a sort of david eddings terry brooks eventually robert jordan like very much a kind of high fantasy sure. guy as as a teenager um and then you know, I sort of I I wrote a very bad fantasy novel as a teenager that was sort of a rip off of all of all of those. I played around with some fantasy writing in college, and then at a certain point, um, partially or mostly left it behind. And in my twenties, was mostly reading you know whatever literary fiction the New Republic was recommending at at the time. And then at a certain point, um, you know, in my mid thirties, I got sick. I was sort of chronically ill for a long time. I found myself, you know, I was able to write newspaper columns, but I sort of, we also had kids, you know, your your mental, your mental architecture and landscape changes. Um, and I just really, I sort of struggled to read sort of highbrow or even high middlebrow literary fiction. And I ended up sort of coming back to coming back to genre and reading a lot of the sort of rereading some stuff from my youth, some of which was obviously crap. Um, and also trying not completely, I, I wouldn't consider myself sort of a total adept in contemporary fantasy, but I, you know, reading, reading, I, I just found that it was sort of at the level that my, uh, 
slightly ill, slightly internet addled, slightly parenthood addled brain was uh, capable of reading. But this is it all makes it sound like I'm, you know, sort of sort of sneering at my own taste. I, I mean, I also think I'm also an apologist for for fantasy, especially, I think, at a, at a certain level. I think it I think it's I'd rather live in a world of, you know, where fantasy filmmaking ma- filmmaking conquered everything than the world where Marvel conquers everything. I think the fantasy genre is really interesting and sort of does a lot of work that sort of realist literature struggles, like struggles to do in certain ways. I think there's reasons that Tolkien and, you know, Harry Potter and everything, you know, all of the various emanations have sort of conquered, conquered the world. Um, And it's not just a case of sort of, you know, pulp, pulp overcoming highbrow. It's also that um, fantasy does some things that realist literary fiction doesn't do at all. Yeah, um, so there's a lot there. You know, I I will say uh, for the listeners, viewers out there, uh, my trajectory, probably similar to Ross in a lot of ways. Um, I did read, you know, I was one of those uh, teens that would read the multi-volume Tolkien ripoff or derivative. Because some of this stuff, you know, there was a whole genre of uh, post-Tolkien fantasy, which, you know, literally aped a lot of, you know, you know, they used elves and all the standard Tolkien, you know, tropes. Um, you know, I, I read a lot of that. And then, you know, I did um, when I stumbled. Up, so I started reading. Okay, a lot of people know this story, but I, I will tell it again. I started reading uh, Game of Thrones in uh, around January 20th of 1999. Mm-hmm. And um, I started reading on Friday night. I fell asleep. And then I kept reading it to Sunday and I failed a biochemistry midterm on Monday. So, and then I got like Clash of Kings, which had just come out in hardcover. I read that. And then I told, uh, I emailed George R. R. Martin. I was like, I really like your books. Um, I, I didn't do very well on that test. And then six months later, he emailed me back to apologize. He was still responding to emails back then. You know, but so I got, yeah. I got into this and I, I went into like, I remember I went into like, it wasn't like, I don't know if it was CompuServe, but it was like one of those uh, chat uh framework and like george R. Martin came and we had a chat this was like the year 2000 um i pre-ordered okay i'm making myself sound really like a virgin right now but i did pre-order um storm of swords from england because it was published three months earlier in england and i was like you know i'm just gonna i don't think they do that as much anymore because you know ebooks and all that but um so i was really into that and i would talk to people about it and I remember, and this is this is over twenty years ago, and they would look at me like, "Wow, you're you're really too into this." And then a decade later, of course, Game of Thrones comes out, and everyone's telling me about this, and I'm just like, "What is happening here?" Yeah, no, I mean, I left I left George R. R. Martin out of that that sort of personal arc that I just gave you, but like it's it is in fact the case that yeah, I sort of I also read the first three Martins when they came out. And that was sort of, I think of that as sort of like the end point of my early fantasy reading that, that, and um, a series by a writer named Tad Williams uh, called memory, sorrow and thorn sort of came out and was completed around the time I was in college and Martin had done his first three books. And I would have said that sort of Martin and Williams were my two favorite fantasy novelists at that point. I thought they had sort of taken the genre further than, you know, the sort of Tolkien knockoffs that I that I had been reading, reading before. And then, yeah, when, uh, you know, when Ga- Game of Thrones comes on HBO at around sort of around the time I got back into fantasy. So I basically got back into it when everyone else seemed to, or not everyone else, but the non-versional population <laughs> seemed to be, seemed to be getting into it for the first time. And there were totally like in college, there were like two other guys who I remember it was like a secret handshake. They were like, Oh yeah, we, we got storm of swords too. And you know, the red wedding blew my mind, man. And um, yeah, I think between us, we had had like 0.2 girlfriends at that, at that point. So um yeah so i had to uh yeah i don't, I don't know if this if i t- tell people on the podcast this i had to um kind of read furtively 
in college uh, because my girlfriend at the time, she had some negative opinions about the genre and she would just like not shut up about it, you know? So I'd like go out to the park, you know, she's like, what have you, what were you doing in the park? Like one time she guessed, you know, it's like, uh, there's a whole, there was a whole cultural, um, I don't know. I don't want to say shame, but it was kind of, it was kind of like playing D and D or something, you know, it was one right. of those things that like losers did. Magic then, the uh, gathering, right? It was yeah. Like, that sort of you know, stuff. The, the guys. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was associated with role playing games. It was low. I mean, I, I would say, yeah, it was always low status somehow, even within the range of um, of genre stuff. It was like Renaissance Fair, you know, you're sort of that something about like at least the sci fi guys were going to go on and, you know, work in Silicon Valley or something. Yeah. But the, but the fan the fantasy guys, you know, yeah, yeah. No, there, there was there was no hope for them. Yeah. And then, I'm sorry, and then, and then, as we allude to HBO, there's Game of Thrones. Now there's, you know, the new uh, Fire and Blood uh, spinoff that's doing well. I don't really like the. Uh, I mean, okay, nobody really likes the new, uh, whatever it is, Rings of Power thing. But no. I mean, it's indicating, you know, if if the media is putting all this money into it, um, that means that it is mainstream. And then you were talking about the Marvel. We can't really ignore that. I mean. Is it really even, is it not fantasy? I mean, in a way it is, it's just not very, it's not very complex. There's like the world building is kind of weird. Um, and, you know, but that's what comic books are the source material from. I mean, it's comic books, right? In comic books, I, you compare, yeah, I, uh, yeah, go on, go on. I, I, think, I, think, I, I, think the lo- I think the line between fantasy and sci-fi is itself actually a lot blurrier than people think and that there's this whole terrain of you know what sometimes gets called space opera or something that basically is sort of it's doing a lot of the same kind of work that fantasy novels do that but both you know the two biggest sci-fi pop cultural things um arguably are star wars and and dune with star wars obviously like in a league of its own and i think they both you know, they're they're closer to fantasy than a lot of what you would call like hard hard science fiction. Certainly, like you know, do, Dune. I mean, you know, it's it's literally set in a in a distant future where there's been a revolution against um, artificial intelligence and robotic technology. Right? It's sort of a, like it's sort of the a wilf, willfully anachronistic future. Um, so I think that line is is somewhat blurry. I think superheroes are doing are doing something quite different even though there is yes some sort of overlap in terms of like how they play off mythological tropes and and so on um but i i think that i think that that's you know superheroes are sort of the the appearance of godlike beings within the modern landscape and whatever mm-hmm. fantasy is doing the important thing is that it's creating a different it's 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 a different landscape from our own that's that's i think yeah sort of that central that it's it can be a landscape that's in transition to modernity and in fact i think a lot of what makes fantasy interesting is that it is about the transition to modernity in different ways but it can't just be you know i mean you can do the modern world and people leave it to go somewhere else which you know this is what narnia is right this is you know thomas the saga of thomas covenant to pick uh you know titles from our from the 80s yeah. and 90s but you can't just have it be magic in the modern world it has to be a different usually pre-modern world to qualify i think yeah yeah i mean so i think that's classic traditional fantasy and so there's this idea um of secondary worlds so you know it became big after tolkien um where it's basically you know it's kind of like our world but they're you know magic is real you know uh so for example earth sea uh lagoon uh you have kind of like a different different continents it's more like indonesia in a lot of ways okay but i mean they're human they have our same feelings you know there's not that many you know pascal boyer cognitive psychologist has this idea of minimally counterintuitive narratives and those are the narratives we really enjoy because they're a little different so they're not boring but we actually have enough references to kind of understand and so um you know, fantasy with so Tolkien's fantasy, as as most of the listeners know, is 
you know, drawn from his work as a Beowulf scholar, from, you know, early medieval work and sometimes even older Norse uh, Scandinavian work. So it draws from the material of our world, rearrange it, but it's not really constructed de novo. And one of the things that actually, um, so I, I got into this just out of curiosity was, I, do you know that um, Robert Jordan, The Wheel of Time, and I think, you know, a lot of listeners and viewers will have read this. Do you know that that's actually set on Earth? Yes. Yes, I think that's pretty yeah. clear from from early on that it's like it's set in an earth that is the you know the wheel of time is literally this sort of cycle of history, <laughs> yeah. right? And so there's so it's like references, multiple ages, yeah, right. And there's so references like, to I think we're like they're like three ages away from our age yes, because they reference yeah. Len who went to the moon in an eagle made of fire. You know, there's yeah. some like there's like and there's a few artifacts. Things. Yeah, and there's a few artifacts, like random things. But, I mean, those are kind of like Easter eggs in there. And then right. apparently, you know, Tolkien can be a little confusing here, but apparently, like, Middle Earth is kind of viewed as a pre-modern Earth, which I was a little surprised yes. by. Like, uh, yeah, but it's, 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 yeah. it's, pre, it's, it's European prehistory. I mean, Tol Tolkien yeah. sort of imagined himself as, you know, sort of making up a mythology for the English yeah. who he felt lacked one. But yeah, Gondor. And I mean, if you look at the map, you know, the Hobbits it looks, are it looks in Northwestern like England. Europe. Yeah, they're in yeah. Northwestern England. Gondor is yeah. proto Greece and Rome. Um, and the yeah, and, and and the mythology maps generally onto um, Tolkien's Catholic religion as people as people know well it's not you know it's it's not supposed to be a sort of perfect perfect map uh mapping but yeah no that's that's sort of a common a common movement um and and there's but i mean i think what's interesting is you know Tol i mean tolkien also does things right that you know if you get really if you really dig into it you'll notice that so tolkien right he famously invents languages for for the elves and, you know, various peoples of Middle Earth. But then he also does things to sort of bring things closer to his his readers, right? So actually the hobbits, for instance, have their own, ha have do not in fact speak the language that they appear to speak in Lord of the Rings. Like they're sort of, they have underlying real names and Tolkien has says, look, I took their names and I anglicized them in various ways so bilbo baggins actually has a real name if you go into the appendix of return of the king right bilbo has a real name that that is not bilbo but tolkien is saying look i'm making them seem more english for the you know for the sake of of english readers so and and that that conceit shows up more overtly in other cases where you'll have fantasy novelists saying like i am i have found this document and i am like translating it into terms that 20 you know 20th century or 21st century readers can understand yeah well okay so i want to talk about um you know uh, you know in our emails one thing i want to talk about is like so i when i was you know like i don't know i guess it was like 15 years ago i read some translations of the epic of gilgamesh most of us have read the iliad well okay i don't know Maybe not most of us, but a lot of people have read the Iliad. Listeners, listeners are familiar with the Iliad, yes. Yes, okay. And the Odyssey. The high, the listeners of your podcast, definitely. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, Because sometimes you don't want to assume. But when I read those, um, I think it, it's basically fantasy. You know, I mean, it's not modern fantasy, but it's fantasy. So the Epic of Gilgamesh describes a place and period Basically, 5,000 years ago, if you're reading the Ep Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, I don't know, in the Assyrian period, uh, you know, 2,700, you know, 2,700 years ago, that's thousands of years later. A lot of these, um, a lot of the cities are gone. Uh, the names are unfamiliar. Some of the geography is a little confusing. Uh, there's no horses. And so, you know, I would contend in some ways, I mean, I, so, you know, we were talking about earlier how fantasy has a lowbrow reputation or has like kind of a low reputation in the public, at least in the late 20th century, maybe not today, but um, I would contend that, you know, what we call speculative fiction, if you want to bracket fantasy and science fiction together, uh, they resemble a lot more of uh, narrative story, a lot more like narrative, they're a lot more like narrative storytelling of pre-modern peoples. And what would you say to that? Yeah, I think that's I think that's broadly right. And I don't think it has to be sort of, 
you, you can cite more contemporary examples, right? Where like the not contemporary, but post, uh, you know, Anno Domini examples, right? Where, uh, you know, like the Arthurian mythos, right, is sort of develops in the high Middle Ages and later as a narrative about a, you know, semi-historical king whose actual historical roots are in the Dark Ages, right, in the sixth and in the sixth and seventh century, right. So you're sort of Mallory and the, you know, these, the, even the, you know, the sort of early Arthurian stories or what we think of as the early Arthurian stories. Who's the guy? Uh, Geoffrey of Monmouth, right? Who yeah, writes yeah. the like history, the, you know, more, the sort of do, more to Arthur. Well, Ma yeah. Mallory does more to Arthur, but then that is, but then before that, I think there's a guy named Geoffrey of Monmouth oh, who does this. Okay. Okay. Right? So that was the original yeah. romances, like kind of the Anglo Norman ones, right? Yeah. So I, I mean, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to mix up the details, but basically, yeah, yeah there's sort of this yeah. mixture of like pseudo historiography legend sort of then you know retellings of um semi-historical events in chivalric for frames that make sense in the high middle ages wouldn't have made sense in sort of you know the actual um late antiquity uh or yeah. dark ages where they took place so yeah i mean i think that pattern is definitely there I, I also think that like if you take something like the iliad right like a big part of the appeal of fantasy is that it is basically it speaks to in a way that realist fiction sort of deliberately does not or not completely this sort of human intuition that human life takes place on two levels, right? That there's sort of the, the everyday level of contest for worldly power, goods, romance, you know, sex, violence, politics, and so on. But then that level is also embedded in a sort of cosmic drama. Right. And, you know, this maybe this is the drama of the gods in the Iliad. It's the drama of, you know, the the, the drama of Christianity. Uh, you know, it, it's 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 some kind of, you know, the the what we do in life echoes in eternity line from Gladiator is it's it's always sort of being made sort of literalized by fantasy. Right. So, you know, you see this with Game of Thrones. You have the you know, the the a plot of, you know, sort of recreated medieval politics where the stakes are sort of, you know, immediate, immediate contests for power in a, um, you know, low magic <laughs> setting. Right. And then behind it, you have some kind of cosmic battle, which since Martin never actually finished the saga and <laughs> you, know, you can't really rely on the terrible exactly. last two seasons of the show, we don't actually know, you know, Martin's the, the, the fundamental theology of the Martin novels is still a little bit opaque, but there is some sort of fundamental theological principle at work in most fantasy that, that again, sort of coexists with, with this sort of more everyday form of politics. So it's not just story. It's not just myth, right? It's not just stories about the gods. It's stories about ordinary human beings operating in a landscape where their ordinary battles are sort of being caught up into into a cosmic, a cosmic sweep. Um, yep. And, you know, fantasy, then, I mean, fantasy can sort of, it can sort of separate out those elements again, right? So you have, I mean, there's lots of people who only liked Game of Thrones for the historical recreations. And, and mm -hmm. I, I think the showrunners might have been among those people, they sort of seemed a little bit bored and embarrassed by the magic stuff. And we're like, sort of, all right, we'll, yep. you know, we'll, we'll kill, we'll kill off the White Walkers pretty quick and get back to the you know, the Middle Ages plus dragons um, plot. Uh, but, you know, you have fantasies that are, you know, very, very low magic that are just sort of like, you know, just sort of historical fiction where you don't know the ending. And that's, and, I mean, that, and that is a yeah. big, a big part of, I mean, certainly to me as a reader, it's part of fantasy's appeal. I like historical novels, but in historical novels, unless you're reading Harry Turtle Dove, you know, you know, in the end, yeah, you know, and, you know what's going to happen to Anne Boleyn. You know what's going to happen. You know, Wolf Hall is brilliant, but we know the ending, right? Um, and that that doesn't knowing the ending in advance doesn't preclude literary greatness. But there is sort of as a reader enjoyment in just not knowing what you know how the Starks and Lannisters um, are are going to end things up. But I, I think to the extent that fantasy sort of achieves real artistic liftoff, I think it has to be in this sort of combination that the, 
the sort of the more purely magical fantasy gets, the less interesting it is. And the more purely, you know, we're just doing historical fiction. I think the less interesting it gets, there's sort of a, an ideal a fusion there, a mix. That's often, again, about, you know, Le Guin, I don't love Le Guin, but there's sort of a neat perfection <laughs> to her, to her books. And they are in their own way about like, you know, the, the end, the decline of magic or the restoration of magic. And that's that I think um, if there's an essay that uh, Alan Jacobs, who's a, a professor, an English professor, um, who wrote about fantasy, I think for the New Atlantis many years ago. Yeah. That was basically well, he, used, a, I mean, he, he used to blog with you at the American right scene. at the American like, scene. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, back in the day. But I that that essay has been sort of a touchstone for my understanding, and he spends a lot of time arguing that a lot of fantasy is about sort of you know this sort of disenchantment and reenchantment, and sort of the world in this state, worlds that are in a state in between enchantment and disenchantment, and sort of moving back and forth between them like in Tolkien the elves are leaving right like you know the 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 victory the victory for white magic also ends white magic yeah and so um I, I want to talk about Tolkien uh because uh you know you mentioned that was a big deal when you were younger and I think uh yeah it was same with me in elementary school I remember in sixth grade it's around like 1990 and uh like a bunch of us in the class, mostly guys, but not exclusively guys, we just decided to start reading because, like, we'd read The Hobbit for class or something, and we decided to read, you know, Lord of the Rings series. And I remember it was like, I mean, like it's like tiny font, like this was, you know, I mean, it was it wasn't like trivial for a sixth grader, but it was something that we did. And then the teacher like showed us like uh, I think it was the Ralph Bakshi, like the incomplete. Oh, uh, yeah, cartoons yeah. yeah remember those and so that was like a whole thing um and but at the time because it's before the internet and wikipedia um i vaguely knew that it was written decades earlier but this is you know almost 40 years after they originally came out right and the hobbit was what came out in the 30s um you know tolkien had died you know 20 almost 20 years earlier um so obviously tolkien and Lord of the Rings uh, looms large over any discussion of fantasy. I mean, English speaking fantasy for sure, but I think just fantasy as a whole, like as you implied earlier, there's so many Tolkien knockoffs. I mean, Terry Brooks and the Shannara series, there's the, whole, the sort of there's whole yeah. like, yeah. yeah. The sort of Shannara, which is one of those sort of, you know, what I would think of as the pulp books that I, that I read as a teen. It's just like a beat for beat. Recre yeah. recreation of, of Lord yeah. of the Rings in this amazingly shameless way. Um, yeah, and he made but, a lot of money off it. He made a lot of yes, money he, off it. So, I mean, respect. respect and he, but... and he wrote many more novels that were less <laughs> less knockoffy. So, you know, I mean, you, you do what it takes to get started. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, I guess I'm going to ask you, like, um, why do you think uh, Tolkien uh, is so su seminal? Because... I, I reread some of the stuff, and uh, he's not like you know. For the listeners out there that are into this, like uh, Gene Wolf, like okay, like that's like a pro stylist, a genius yep. there. Uh, Tolkien's not necessarily a pro stylist. Like some of the stuff is good, but some of the stuff is like whatever, you know. Um, in terms of the plot, it can be a little bit slow sometimes uh, compared to some of the stuff that you read today. Uh, so, I mean, give me your take for why Tolkien, because I mean, this isn't an argument. He's incredibly right. influential. He's like the giant, the looming over everything. Why? Why is he such a big deal? Right. Well, I mean, there's two arguments you can make. One is just that he is the first to do to sort of on that scale attempt what you use the term earlier, secondary creation. Right. The idea that you're not just telling a sort of fairy tale that's in a long ago and far away. You know, you're not just doing a sort of historical thing. You're not even just doing like a sort of visit to elf land kind of deal right where someone goes through a door and ends up in in fairy you're trying to create even if it is technically our world a full you know a fully persuasive um alter you know alternative landscape with its own history its own personalities its own deep myths you have layers in tolkien that i think work much more effectively actually in lord of the rings than in the sort of 
in the Silmarillion, the sort of, you know, I, I'm, I'm a much bigger fan, you know, of the, uh, of the core Tolkien than I, I'd much rather reread Lord of the Rings than read, than read the Silmarillion. But part of what makes Lord of the Rings work so well is this sense that like everything that's in the Silmarillion is sort of implied in these small grace notes throughout the book and then sort of distilled in the appendix to return of the King. So, yeah, I mean, even even independent of the of the sort of specific storytelling, Tolkien achieved something at a depth and scale that hadn't been even really attempted before. You can cite some antecedents, but not at this scale. Has a skill set as, you know, a, a student of languages that enables him to basically make this richer, like, in, than almost any successor could possibly attempt. Like there's lots of things that subsequent fantasists can do better than Tolkien, but nobody's matching him for like sort of the linguistic credibility <laughs> right, of, of the landscape he builds or it's, you know, or it's sort of effective connection. Like, you know, as you mentioned, he said sort of the deep, deep scholarship of Northern Europe that goes into this, this particular sub creation is just really really hard to match. Um, you know, in the contrast, he was friends with C.S. Lewis, right? And Lewis writes the Narnia books somewhat contemporaneously. The Narnia books are great. They're brilliant, but they're just doing something completely different. They're, you know, they're telling brilliant children's stories with a kind of theological subtext, um, but in a world that no one would mistake for like a full secondary creation. Narnia is, Narnia does not exist as a thing unto itself. It's like a place for people from earth to visit and see pieces of earth reflected back to them. And, and Tolkien actually sort of, you know, he had a certain, certain, was certainly a little bit dismissive towards Lewis for these reasons. He was like, what are you doing putting Father Christmas right in the Lion and the Witch in the Wardrobe? That doesn't make any sense. Um, so that's part of it. It's just sort of depth, commitment, and, you know, sort of getting there first. Um, but then, I mean, the this, this story itself is, in fact, for all of, you know, sort of the weird, you know, the, the moments that are not, he, I, I agree. He's not, he's not a stylist on the scale of Gene Wolfe or, you know, you could pick some other sort of more literary minded fantasists. There are various issues here and there, right. Um, in, in the stories, but he does, he, well, he has more, I think, complexity and psychological depth and insight than there's sort of a crude, a caricature that says, you know, Tolkien is just telling stories about perfect heroes. And then, you know, finally George R. R. Martin came along and showed us heroes who, you know, who, who aren't really that heroic and murder people. And so, I mean, this is true. Martin's books have way more sex and sort of violence and grim, dark stuff and so on. Right. And, you know, there's obviously like a certain kinds of realism that Tolkien isn't interested in. But in terms of like, you know, the psychology of addiction, right, and sort of the nature, the nature of power and temptation and so on, there's lots of, re you know, there's the idea that like everyone in Tolkien is black and white is absurd. Tolkien is filled with characters who, you know, Saruman and Wormtongue and Denethor, who are sort of on on this spectrum well, in between. Even Frodo and at the end. And even right to story. Right. Not to spoil the, it for people, but not yeah. to spoil it. Right. But but right. The the story the the ring bearer fails in the end and has to be rescued by by his, you know, his servant, basically, who is arguably the, you know, the, the final the final hero of the story. Um, so, you know, I mean, it, and then obviously sort of beyond that, there's the sense in which part of Tolkien's appeal is precisely the things that are distinct from what Martin is trying to do, right? Like the people who, yeah. you know, the appeal, th there is a sort of nostalgic element and a kind of, you know, romantic, romantic chivalric element to, to his appeal. That's part of fantasy's appeal too, that is stronger in him than, especially once you get into the last 10 or 20 years where everyone's trying to be really grim and gritty and realistic. I don't know. Have you read any, read any Joe Abercrombie? No, but I know of him. Yeah. Yeah. So he's yeah. a guy who's like sort of, I would think of him as like George R. R. Martin's George R. R. Martin, right? Like if you think Martin's books are sort of just sex and violence and cynical power politics, Abercrombie is doing a world where it's just all that. And it's sort of, it's a little more comic than Martin's books. Um, there's, you know, there's, but you know, the, the, 
all, all of the figures who are sort of magical or sort of connected to the uh, light versus dark conflicts are ultimately subverted. Um, mm-hmm. And and he does some interesting things with he has a, a few books that are sort of basically genre mashups where he has a book that's like set during a single fantasy battle. That's basically like the killer angels like Gettysburg, but about in a fantasy world and one that's sort of the count of Monte Cristo revenge saga in a fantasy world. And there's some, there's some really, th- those are sort of the most interesting things he does. But if you read those books, if you read like a few of them in a row, you, you come to the end and you're like, Hmm, maybe, you know, maybe I'll go back. <laughs> Maybe I'll go back to to Tolkien, you know, to Tolkien's heroes, yeah. right? That sort of the genre can be pushed so far into grimness that you know you can see why this sort of yes. you know this sort of pre modern aspects of it. I mean, Tolkien was in World War One. He was not, you know, there's nothing naive exactly about Tolkien, but there is a kind of aspiration that that I think is important to the genre and can be sort of lost in certainly like the post, some of the post Martin writers. Yeah. So I, you know, I'm going to say something here in terms of, I think the reason that I really enjoyed Martin was uh, he kind of brought, I mean, his world building is different. Uh, It's not better or worse. It's just somewhat different. I would say uh, than Tolkien's world building. So it was rich, but also uh, yeah, maybe I had read too many kind of Tolkien ripoffs where it was kind of like trying to be epic and, you know, I don't want to say sanitized, but, you know, they didn't show kind of like the blood and guts of, of reality in the medieval world. So, you yep. know, you encounter Martin and you're like, OK, like this, 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 you know, shit's getting real here. And, um, you know, I enjoyed that. But I have to say, um, I don't read that much fiction anymore. Like maybe when I'm sick and I can't concentrate on anything else I do. Um, and so I'll read things. and I'm like, you know, I don't want to you know what, like, I'm just like, kind of tired of the darkness. (laughs) Like, it's kind of like, exhausting me. And um, what I tell a lot of people is people watch Game of Thrones, the TV show. um, To me, what's always striking is Ramsey Bolton on the show is less disgusting, evil and perverted than he is in the books. And uh, that's just like, I don't really understand. But it's but it's but it's different with TV. He's less but it's everything he does in the books happens off stage. Right. Like, the, I mean, to me, the difference, it's it is true that if you go like event by event, there's plenty of stuff in the books that's darker even than what's in the TV show. But it's the film is just a different kind of medium and you're lingering sure. over things and showing them rather than showing rather than describing, but also showing things that the books sort of say, oh, you know, well, this happened. This guy got tortured and castrated and the books are like and the show is like, let's watch him get tortured and and castrated. I mean, I I sort of stick up a little bit for Martin on the in the sense that his books are not like they're not purely cynical, right? It's like okay, you have the Starks and the Lannisters and it turns out hey, the Lannisters are complex and interesting. They aren't just like cardboard bad guys, but fundamentally the Starks are the good guys and the Lannisters are the bad guys, right? And um you know, and and I mean, I again, we don't know where he intended the story to end up, but there is, you know, the, the the White Walkers do not seem fundamentally like a morally ambiguous force. It seems like it would be good if they were defeated. Um, and even, you know, Martin has a sort of attenuated version of Christianity, a sort of, you know, a sort of polytheistic church that somehow has Christian ethics, which doesn't make a ton of sense, but sort of it's like it's basically like a weaker form of medieval chivalry sort of hanging around in the background. Um, yeah. So I don't I don't think Martin is sort of full. He's he's like halfway to full grimdark in certain ways. Um, but and also yeah. but what he does, what he does is plot like and this is, again, why the show fell apart once they ran out of his books. Right. But Martin, it's just yeah. like the plot, you know, the unexpected, re- the reversals the sort of plot dynamics that just up through Storm of Swords, especially. I mean, I think he had already started to lose his way when he got Daenerys trapped in Marine in the in the in the fifth book. But Storm of Swords, like what he does with plot reversals and drama in that in those books is just really effective. And that's a side that's sort of a marriage of fantasy tropes with the larger genre of like 
pulp paperbacks, right? Something Stephen King at his, you know, at yeah. his best or Tom Clancy, right? To take sort of our, you know, our 1990s, you know, 1990s analogs, like bringing in the general sort of paperback plotting to fantasy, I think was Martin's, Martin's biggest, biggest artistic success in a way. The shock of like, I mean, if you reread the Red Wedding scene in Storm of Swords, it's just really, really well done where you're reading it and you're like, yeah. something is really, really wrong in this scene. And it just goes on for pages and pages and builds and builds to the, you know, the, the horror right at the end. Um, and even there, that's a good example. The show like adds, you know, the stabbing of the pregnant woman in the stomach. Like, it's just like there's the show was always um, I think I somebody maybe it wasn't me called it like goring the lily instead of gilding the lily, like adding one mm-hmm. extra layer of of stuff. I don't know. Yeah. Well, so um, I want to ask you, uh, you know, the, the rings of power, you know, there was some stuff. Well, actually, like a lot of it was on YouTube uh, uh, about, you know, how they kind of made it woke. There was a little bit of that in the House of the Dragon, but I feel it was kind of fake. So that, so just for the listener and viewer who don't know what I'm talking about, House of the Dragon, they made House Valerian black, basically. Yep. Um, and they're supposedly pure Targaryens, just like... Uh, well, just like the target, well, not pure target, pure, pure, Valyrian. pure Valyrians. Yeah, and so it's like they never really explain it, um, but whatever. Uh, it kind of is like not a big deal, and they never really explain it. So in a way, it's whatever you kind of forget about it. But when it comes to the Rings of Power, um, there's like a black elf. And there's the like, clear indications that people are racist against him. And it just seems really weird because I watched it mostly because I wanted to. Anyway, I just wanted to like watch it so I could know what I hated. You know, like I kind of already suspected I wouldn't like it, but I decided I'll, I, I'll watch it. So I watched the whole thing. Um, one of the things that I've written about, um, I've actually like, you know, written about, I don't write, write about fantasy that much, but when people try to make fantasy quote woke, um, a, to me, a lot of it kind of fails because a lot of uh, the modern egalitarian social justice ethos, I mean, it kind of works in Star Trek. Star Trek was kind of built like that uh, right. in a post-materialistic world. That's not what fantasy is. Like fantasy is like literally like a throwback to older structures and you're rearranging older structures and it just seems a little weird. It seems it seems like just really implausible to me when they interject. Um, you know, they the elves. The, show the elves Potter. will take all our jobs. That in in yeah. Rings of Power, where they're I, like I, the, the they're like the elves. They're they're immortal. So you know they're <laughs> they're the immortal illegal immigrants stealing our jobs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I mean, mean that was rings, okay. I mean that was yeah. really high speed. Yeah, I mean the ring, Rings of Power. I, I don't know if it's. I mean, one, I thought it was basically terrible. Like it had a few good elements, but it seemed to be made unlike unlike House of the Dragon by people who had no special affection for the source material and had been given a ton of money and were able to like conjure up some really beautiful visuals and and sort of nothing, nothing else. Um, In terms of politics, I don't even know. I mean, you you mentioned the sort of like minimal what what was the phrase the minimal believable difference and minimally or, counterintuitive minimally not minimally counterintuitive. counterintuitive right so so my yeah I mean my complaint about what they do with race and ethnicity in that is that yeah if you want to set up a fantasy world that has racial differences that's great and there's lots of sort of interesting things you can do playing around with that and sort of subverting expectations because obviously Ra- racial and ethnic differences, you know, are are themselves part of part of the pre modern world, even if they are sometimes interpreted differently. And like, you know, again, Le Guin's novels, um, you know, are set in a world where almost everyone is brown skinned, except like these white, you know, Viking like bad guys who come. But in they're evil. Raiders, right? <laughs> the evil. The evil. Well, they're not. I mean, you know, the the the. They're complicated them is, themselves. Yeah. Tadam, right. They, yeah. They, they're complicated, too. But the. But in Rings of Power, it's just this sort of thing that is now done in lots of shows where, you know, you ha- you'll you have a civilization and the civilization will, every civilization will be sort of perfectly multi-ethnic in some weird way, right? So like the island nation of Numenor, which is supposed to be this. Wait, 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 wait. I got to say about Numenor, Numenor's demographics are like a medium-sized Midwestern city. 
right? Yes. It's just like, like kind of mostly white ethnic, and then there's like a large number of black Numenorians there. And I'm not talking about black Numenorians like in Tolkien. Right. Like the yeah. nerds out there would be like, wait a second. <laughs> anyway, they probably right. don't know. No, the producers don't know what black Numenorians are, but... <laughs> Yeah, it's just it's and and this is the same with it seemed to be the same with the elves and the dwarf, dwarves and so on, right? Like each each race, each of Tolkien's races look like a sort of, you know, a racially diverse Ivy League campus. And, you know, in the you could come up with an interesting fantasy world explanation for, I guess, for why that would be like why, you know, sort of phenotypes and so on work out that way in this particular wor- world, whereas in our world, different populations tend to, you know, share skin color, but it's, it's clear that they weren't, it's not that they were doing that. They just sort of wanted to have diverse casting and went with sort of the absolute laziest way to do it. Right. And that, whereas in house of the dragon, there was an attempt to say, okay, you have some distinct bloodlines and they used, you know, differences in, in sort of skin color sort of entered in in interesting ways. In when in one the plot kid is a, well, yeah, when one kid is illegitimate or the product of, of an affair and so on, it just, it's just that again, that seemed more connected to our actual world. Whereas rings of power is taking place in a world again, where somehow you're in a medieval landscape and yet every you know, these cities that are like set apart, you know, set apart from the world for thousands of years yeah. look like Cambridge, Massachusetts. And yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not, again, it's, that's not the primary problem. That's not the primary dramatic problem um, with, with rings of power. Uh, but it's not, it's not an effective use of diverse casting, I would say. Well, I, I would say, you know, the fact that they can interpolate or try to interpolate these modern, very modern, very contemporary, very recent concerns into Rings of Power is indicative of the fact that they aren't really, um, you know, they're not honoring the source material because the source material is so rich. They could have done so much. Instead, they have kind of like this thin, flimsy plot that was very, very obvious, that was fake. Uh, and then, you know, they have a lot of special effects. And now they just got to, like, put some stuff in there to kind of fill it out, you know? So, like, okay, add that weird, you know, the elves took her gerbs scene. Okay, like, that's super weird. I mean, everyone, I mean, I think most people probably laughed when they saw it because, like, it just, like, seemed weird. And then there's, you know, you know, situations where, like, okay, like, there's racism against the elf. But it's not because he's an elf. It's because he's a black elf. I, you know, and then, of course, Was like, it? Uh, I, 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 I thought it was just supposed to be anti-elf racism and then it was just okay so maybe 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 it's a little bit more subtle like but i yeah i don't know the whole thing seemed i mean that you know that kid got got what what was due to him of course because he's you know evil you know bigot but (laughs) i don't know well but right and they i mean the show generally had i mean i was praising martin for his sort of taking like pulp novel plotting and bringing it into fantasy rings of power took basically the sort of jj abrams like puzzle box or puzzle whatever mystery box style of tv where it's like who is this mysterious character what is his plan we can actually probably tell what's going on already but you know sort of trying to like do these sort of lost style mysteries within the framework of an epic fantasy saga and you know there's ways to do that like i mentioned before tad williams his memory sorrow and Thorn trilogy has this kind of unexpected reversal at the end where the prophecy turns out to not be quite what you expected. Like, you know, there's ways to do sort of plot twists, but in the Rings of Power series, it was just clearly like we are imitating serial television and trying to like drop clues for people. But in fact, this is a, you know, it's a well established mythology <laughs> like that does not, does just does not lend itself to that. To that kind of thing and yeah and doesn't yeah no that 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 well, was I yeah mean, and so gen- you mentioned Tad Williams a couple hard, times. i do want to give a i think give a shout out um he it, is uh the, the marvel movies obviously like su- superhero movies the, the sort of as much as they annoy me you can there are plenty of examples of fully successful superhero blockbusters and we just have a lot for all the experiments in fantasy tv we have a lot fewer of those the jackson lord of the rings movies worked the jackson hobbit movies are terrible um game of thrones worked until it fell apart um 
House of the Dragon is okay. But then, you know, the the Wheel of Time series that Amazon made is not very good. It, you know, it's 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 proven hard to translate fantasy, I think. Can you, um, Ross, can you talk a little about uh, writing fantasy yourself and how that felt? Like, because you, you've done it recently. Yeah, um, sure. I, yeah, I mentioned that I sort of experimented with writing fantasy in high school. And then in addition to sort of going back to... Um, reading fantasy in the last five to seven years, I also sort of went back and took the bones of a fantasy novel that I had worked on a little bit when I was like 23 and tried to sort of work through it and flesh it out and turn it into a, more of a real novel. Um, and and that novel exists in some way. It's like 600 pages long. It's the first book of a trilogy. Um, it doesn't have a publisher. It may not deserve a publisher. Uh, Interested listeners can go to my Substack, <laughs> out that dot Substack dot com, and I put up the first two chapters because I've basically had to turn to other projects. I'm not, I'm just not sure what I'm going to do with it, but um, I'll probably turn back to it. You know, the main the main challenge is that my day job is fairly hectic, and good writers of fiction, I think, are fully committed yeah. to it. And you know, the advice I got from some a couple real fantasy novelist was, you know, if, if publishers are passing on it, it probably means you should just, you know, put it away and try a new project at some point, which unfortunately means for me would be like 10 years. <laughs> I'd have time to start something afresh. Um, but it, it's a, you know, it's, it's a fairly conventional sort of fantasy story um, where it's sort of, you know, set in a, set in a kind of like, post-Roman Empire landscape where there's a rising imperial success, sort of successor power that conquers a kind of Welsh style um, landscape in which there are sort of fairy powers. Um, and I'm interested in that stuff in part because of my interest in our contemporary society, where I think we're having a kind of come back for religious idea or sort of spiritual interest in like intermediary powers between God and sure. human beings that you see this in various ways with the return of witchcraft, um, you know, even like, you know, AI, UFOs, um, even, you know, uh, DMT and ayahuasca experiences all sort of fall into this category. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of interested in that, that kind of, uh, that kind of sort of supernaturalism as it plays out uh, in in a fantasy landscape. Um, but since I'm not, you know, I, I, don't, I can't like, you know, give you like six, six writing tips because I, I wouldn't say I've achieved, you know, achieved exactly whatever I'm trying to achieve. But it's a it is definitely a different, you know, most of the writing I do is yeah. you know, about current events in some way. And then when I write books, I'm sort of pulling back to a different a different level but it's still in that sort of zone um where you are sort of engaged with the stream of the news um and i'm sure this is true of writing any kind of fiction but writing fantasy is like you're you're just you're going into a different kind of headspace where the the lens you know you're trying to sort of both I mean, this is, I'm not Tolkien, right? I'm not crafting my own languages, but both sort of the world building and the plotting, you're sort of trying to work through it as a writer, but then you're also, you know, you, I, you take a trip to Lake George or something in upstate New York with my family, right? And I'm there and I'm like, hmm, you know, this sort of landscape yeah. of military landscape with these two lakes, Lake George and Lake Champlain that are sort of almost connected to each other. And wouldn't it be interesting to sort of, you know, have part of the landscape of this empire I'm writing about have sort of two lakes similarly connected in the, you know, you're sort of, again, taking pieces of the real world and um, sort of pillaging it. And yeah, and, and it's, it is, you know, you do sort of feel a little bit the way like the sculptors sort of claim to feel where you're chipping away at marble and revealing something that in some way you think was there was there all the time, right? Like I, there's definitely a sort of element of that, even for even for an unpublished novel, right? That you, you feel like you are sort of, you are not merely inventing something, you are also f discovering something, that there are ways in which whatever you're finding is something that, again, at some, yeah. at some level, 
um, existed maybe just in your own consciousness, maybe somewhere more than more than that all along. And so that's that's a very it's a very interesting experience and very again very different from from most of most of yeah. what I do. I, 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 that's what I actually I'm curious about because you know um, I'm I'm something of a writer myself, you know. And so... <laughs> Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just had to say that. <laughs> the the how you the, the ten thousand word you know Harry Potter fanfic of yours, you know, I've I've, I've read I've read that anyway. Um, but um, so you know when you're reading when you're writing nonfiction, you, you know you're really I mean you've written books, but you also you know do these columns that are restricted. I think sometimes you do blog posts on the New York Times site, so those are obviously a little more freeform, but. So it's constricted or not – okay, it's got like a framework that you use for this nonfiction. And then now you're doing – okay, you're creating a world and dialogue and stuff. Um, when you're writing, does it feel different? Like, you know, kind of like – you know, so for example, if I'm writing something – Okay, I know it's going to be four parts, four to five thousand words each, and it's like you know, like recently I just completed the history of like Iran or whatever, right? I know what the ending is. Yep. I got some beats that I got to hit, and then I fill it in with some anecdotes and you know, interesting illustrative examples, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, so okay, there's I've got a process. Okay, what if I was going to write? I don't know, like. A short story set in the court of Xerxes. Like, okay, that would be totally different, right? And I don't really know like how that would feel. Does it feel different? Because you're writing in both cases, you're writing, but psycholo- are you in a yeah, different, feels, different headspace? I mean, yeah. yeah, it's completely different. It's I mean, it's a little bit. I I wrote a book about uh, being sick with Lyme disease. Um, that is, you know, in its own way. <laughs> you know a sort of supernaturalist weird weirdo like you know going into fairyland kind of story um and even that is just quite quite different from political writing and even the, you know even sort of the kind of historical narratives that, that you do where you're just it's storytelling and sto- i mean obviously like history writing history is a form of storytelling i do some storytelling in my columns i'll be like let me tell you how the republican party got from here to there but there's sort of there's just a different like in 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 memoir and fiction the storytelling is just much more primary and you're very aware um and again i i've not published my fantasy novel so i'm clearly not aware enough right but everything else you're doing serves the story right and you know and probably i mean even just in the piece of the fantasy novel i i put online uh, you know a lot of the feedback was like oh you know this prologue that's pure narrative is great and then the first chapter where you're sort of trying to start the world building gets bogged down and you're giving us too much history, right? And so on, too much backstory. And that I think is, you know, a good example. I mean, you know, you see this in fantasy all the time. Like what is, there's a desire to do world building, but how do you do it in a way that fundamentally is sort of pulling pulling the reader through the story? Um, and that that I think is the sort of one, you know, just one one way to think about the core challenge but it's also you now i mean it's it's freeing right uh, i mean so much i mean so much of what you do as a newspaper columnist is even even though the internet allows you to write longer pieces than you used to and i have a lot of freedom and can write longer essays and it's you know lovely there's still just something very freeing to me about having a blank sheet of paper and saying well here let me let me tell you about a kingdom that never existed and a person you never met. And, you know, it's, you know, you can, you can go anywhere with that. Um, so well, not, not any, you know, not successful, any successful control, or not, right? you have, you have control in a way. Oh yeah. 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 Well, right. No, you can't. Well, right. No. And as I said, what's interesting, yeah, is that you can't actually go anywhere that the story in the end sort of pull, you know, sets the parameters, but you're discovering, you don't know at the outset, what the parameters are or where, you know, which threads are going to go nowhere and you have to spool them back or, you know, which events are going to surprise you. Right. Like, but, but there is sort of an element, again, you get this a little bit in a column, you'll be writing a column and you'll say, Oh, you know, this argument didn't occur to me until I'd written the first four paragraphs. And now the column will take a swerve that I didn't expect. So again, it's not, it's not completely different. Um, but there is, you know, when it's imaginary 
people and imaginary events, there's something sort of more, more startling and gratifying in a way about things happening that you didn't expect to happen when it started out. Things, you know, Stephen King's on writing, his book about writing is quite, which is quite good, you know, talks about this sort of, he call it, talks about like the boys in the basement, I think, this idea that like there's sort of work going on as a writer of fiction in your mind that you yourself are unaware of that surprises you. Um, and I think that's, yeah, that's definitely more true with fictional creation than it is with, um, you know, just with the the stuff that's the bread and butter in different ways of both of our <laughs> professional yeah. work. Um, and, and the freedom too, right? Like, again, you're writing, you know, you, you write these sweeping, these sweeping, I won't call them blog posts because they're on Substack, right? But they sweep, these sweeping historical essays. Um, but at the end of the day, you were you were constrained by, you know, what, what happened in the actual Persian empire. Right. And, um, and that constraint is, you know, Im important. Yeah. You want, it, if you're accurately describing history, but there is something, something yeah. cool about saying, well, what if, you know, what if it was a little bit different? Yeah. I mean, I, I think the thing that's great. And, you know, I talked when I, when I was chatting with George R. R. Martin, like, you know, literally 23 years ago now, um, you know, our our peer, our peer, as you know, our fellow writer. Okay, yeah, right? yeah. But uh, you know, he like admitted he admitted straight up like what he was like mining in terms of like oh he read a history of the Avars he put that to the Dothraki like he knows in his own head right and you ask him he'll tell you um, one thing that I want to ask like this last question I want to ask is like so you got to make characters and stuff like that this is the thing where it's like I have no idea because I don't write this sort of stuff you have to have characters viewpoint characters and obviously you know there are women there are men there's old people there's young people rich people poor people okay so there's different like archetypes but they're human beings and they have to have like characters and whatnot um, so Robert Jordan said that uh, all of the women in Wheel of Time are based on his wife which shows. Um, yes. I think anyone who... they're always <laughs> pulling on they're pulling on their brains hands on it, and folding hands their on arms hips, beneath their you know, breasts. It's always and it's like yeah. I've talked to multiple people. They're not like feminists or anything, but it's like they just get they get sick of that crap. Whatever. I, I, he's he's gone, so I, I'm not gonna like dog on him anymore. But uh, how did you do that? I'm just kind of curious because that's the one thing where I think it would be a little different. Like uh, you know, um, is there someone in your novel that's basically Rehan Salam? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like maybe a, a wizard no, I mean, not ge generally i probably not it's probably more the case that you know you start you start with archetypes i mean this is where you know fa genre fiction can be a crutch right it's like you've got your stock dungeons and dragons characters you've got your you know mysterious this and uncertain that your your ranger and your you know your hobbit analogs and so there's probably a bit of that um in in my book i think interestingly i didn't sort of you know necessarily set out to do this but two of the three you know two, two of the three major point of view characters i have are women um and i would definitely not say i'm basing them on any actual woman in my life which probably means that they're not particularly <laughs> realistic and maybe that's part of the problem too there's there's one character who has, who's sort of in love in love with a princess who he's never gonna never gonna get and the sort of like you know self-flagellating you know, i'm a romantic idiot portions of the book are certainly based on like feelings that i had at age 19 right so you know there's there's things like that like that character connects to a particular period in in my own life um but when i'm creating you know, a character who's like a general obsessed with war and conquest, you're pulling there. It's more like you're pulling on other novels. You know, you're trying to pull in a little, uh, um, you know, Cormac McCarthy meets George Patton or something. And there, I mean, I think and this is sort of a place, maybe a place to finish up. But I think I think there is the potential, you know, fantasy has limits in certain ways but i think what martin was trying to do where you know the sort of you're maintaining this two-tiered vision of you know a sort of cosmic conflict but also a human political level drama and raising the human political level drama to a higher pitch of realism and sort of literary seriousness again martin is not a great pro stylist but what he was trying to do i think there's a 
there's like a perfect version of A Song of Ice and Fire out there. Or like, you know, four books that is not as, you know, not quite, not what Tolkien did, but better at politics mm-hmm. and psychological realism. And I think someone, someone can write that, that like the genre has not, has not yet reached perfection and you need a little more, you know, a, a writer who can do some of the things that, you know, a Cormac McCarthy um, can, can do to sort of bring that to perfection. And um, again, it's not going to be well, not right but, now. Uh, maybe it can be you. No, 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 don't even. Yeah, not, not yet. No, not yet. Yeah. There's time. I, there's you time. Know, I mean, there's a lot time. of the fantasy, cause I was going to say is a lot of yeah. the fantasy writers say that, Oh, they wrote 10 novels before the first was accepted. Yeah, you know, and it's like yeah. so but you're right. But I will I will perfect it I'm at age eighty seven. I'm just saying, saying like let's wait on so, it. All right. All right. Um it was great yeah. talking to you, Ross. Uh I hope uh people enjoyed this conversation, a different perspective from you than you know. Ross contains multitudes and we saw a little bit of that here, okay? Yeah. So um all right, I'll talk to you all later. Right. Thanks Bye, for Ross. having me. Bye. All right, take care. Bye. This podcast for kids.